So welcome to a very special talk as part of our exhibition, Here We Are, Women in Design 1900 to Today. In the year leading up to our exhibition, we researched women designers of the past 120 years, and we're displaying the works of many of them. However, there are many stories that we can't tell in an exhibition, and lots of aspects are difficult to communicate through objects. So that's why we've asked some of the most knowledgeable scholars and prolific practitioners to join us in conversation, and today is one of those occasions. I'm being joined by three very distinguished personalities who each have engaged with the role of women in design on different levels. Two of them have researched historic contexts and important protagonists, and one of them is one of the most prominent design personalities working today. So I'll start by introducing her. Patricia Okiola is a trained architect, as well as a renowned designer and creative director. She's worked with many design companies, including Hayworth, Moroso, Floss and Quadrat. And since 2015, she's also been working with the Italian firm Casina, not only as a designer, but also as a creative director. Patricia was born in Spain, but has been based in Milan from the beginning of her career. And she's also joining me from Milan today. So welcome, Patricia. Hello. <laughs> welcome. Hello. Um, so creative direction is a keyword that's accompanied our project quite a lot, our uh, exhibition research. Um, in our research, we did come across a number of very accomplished women who aren't known today as author designers, but as creative directors who steered entire enterprises towards success through their vision and courage. And one of those personalities was Jeanne Toussaint, who held the position of creative director at Cartier in Paris for over 35 years. She passed away in 1976, but no one knows her work and influence better than Pierre Raniero, He's been with Cartier for many years and has since 2003 held the position of image style and heritage director. And in this role, he's conducted extensive research on Jean Toussaint and continues to work with museums such as us and cultural institutions to ensure that Toussaint's impact and legacy remains remembered. So we're looking forward uh, for Pierre to share some of his knowledge with us today and welcome to Pierre. I think you're in Paris, right? Yes, I am. Thank you. Yes. And uh, hello. good afternoon to all. <laughs> and um, also welcome here to uh, Estelle Nicholas van Osselt, who's very ex and a very experienced curator in the field of Chinese and Asian art and archaeology, now with the Hong Kong Palace Museum. Mm -hmm. Estelle is currently working on the exhibition Power of Women, which is due to open in 2023, and it traces the role of women in Asian societies through jewelry. Welcome to Estelle. Thank you. Hello. So um, I'll direct uh, some questions at each of you and encourage you to, to all kind of contribute to these because I think everything is relevant um, to each of you. So perhaps I can start with you, Patricia. As I said, you are someone who doesn't need an introduction really, and you have already accrued so many successes. But when you look back at the start of your career and also your studies in a field that was very male dominated, did you ever feel that being a women designer presented you with very gender specific challenges? And perhaps you can take us back to those beginnings. Oh, well, I... Very happy to speak in, in this kind of uh, circumstance and uh, conversation. Obviously, there is a lot to, to, to change, to modify, to make sure, to make grow and to, to, to go through. No? But um, if I have to think about uh, how was my, my, so my beginning, no? it's, um, it's fun. First, uh, I've been helped, uh, I think, uh, by, by a very uh, woman, power, woman power family. A lot of, I was one, one, one of the younger one, and uh, there was a lot of, a lot of woman opinions in, family, in my family. And I had a father that was not really authoritative. I was uh, authoritarian, really with a quite open mind. He was an engineer, but he loved to be an architect, but he was not so good drawing and uh, was very academic, the university. And he was, when I began to say, when I was quite young, when I wanted to do architecture, he identified himself with me strongly then. Is uh, I think my family helped me uh, to 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 go through society in a certain way. Second, I I, I am 
a person that was a, um, a, a pre-Erasmus, no? then I needed to, to move from my comfort zone, from Madrid, I was studying architecture. When I came to Milano, then I, I think happened a second thing that perhaps helped me in, in this argument, because I had a, a duality of, uh, of minorities. In some way, I was I want to be a designer, to be an architect, and to to work in a certain way and with in the best uh, way I could. But at the same time, I was in any case a woman architect, and at the same time, I was um, a Spanish uh, architect in uh, in a Milanese uh, Italian uh, context. Which all those things they they became they can become for you more or less important. It, it depends on how you are or how you feel them, no? And I think having these dualities and having a right in, in between those boundaries, I think uh, that helped me to, to, to bring me less, uh, so to not feel never oppressed about that. I think I was more intended to become a villainist in a certain way than to have the problem of being a woman in, in a land of uh, men. Milano was quite open to a creativity or to people with creativity. That, that, that for me, that was important when I was young. Then I think now it's a long way and uh, all these things, they are mixed in, in, my, in my path and, and in my life. And then it's, but I think when I was young, these two things were, were, were fun. They, they, they helped me to overcome even my own personal uh, prejudices. I opened the studio a bit late. Possibly it has to do with the fact of being a woman. Perhaps. What, and, do, you, what do you mean by late? Well, no, I, I didn't, I think um, I, I waited to have uh, my daughter and to grow it a little bit, to, took time for these things. And a certain moment I said, I have to have my own studio. Then I, if I, perhaps if I was a man, I, I should open before. Then it will look with a sincere eye to, to our circumstance. We find a lot of things in our past. They mustn't be general, uh, general for everyone. They are yours, no? Yeah, and that brings me to my next point, because because when we um, researched women designers in history, um, we realized that it wasn't so easy because they often changed careers or they started and stopped. Yifat Seisel, for instance, who's a very renowned ceramicist, she uh, apparently kind of didn't work um, on ceramics for about 20 years, but pursued other careers. Or Marianne Brandt, who was with the Bauhaus, she also kind of had a very meandering life and you Patricia have mentioned to me before that you feel that perhaps many women are a lot more flexible in their careers can you elaborate what you meant by that well when we speak about flexibility I, I think when we're speaking about the feminine side the masculine side for me they are both in your personality then um, the density of how much feminine you are or how much uh, you know that side of your character is in you it's better that it's not a society that finds you. Then I prefer that individuals decide uh, this argument with a bit more freedom than is being always. But uh, in the middle of this, I think the feminine side is uh, the more connective, possibly no side, perhaps is a, is a, a new common, I don't know, but in some way uh, we are speaking about um, more um, connection, not in the energy or, or in the power, more to be more interested in what means uh, uh, interconnection, uh, to, to be even the contamin all the positive contaminations that they are transparent, they are part of our life and they are so important, I think. Then I, I think, you know, so personage like uh, Donna Haraway, they are kind mm -hmm. of uh, eco feminist uh, biologist uh, um, that, that she would, I remember a book from her cyber manifesto that was intended to be centered in an argument uh, to the digital civilization with a lot of thoughts in one way and then now she, she wrote a, a book with staying with the trouble the Chulucena, which is making us think where we are all our compost you know that we are inside <laughs> a kind of more dense uh, uh, interrelated Related um, Gaia or word, or you can call it as you want. And in this um, more magmatic circumstance, we, we are part of the compost. And I, I think this, uh, um, a kind of, it's, it's those kind of women, as Donna Haraway, they, they evolute in their thought. Echo. Um, I believe in all the people that have this flexibility, not only, you know, because I'm adaptive to do a family and to work office, but in the time, to, in the way you grow, in the way you evolve. I think we are in a, we are adult, we are in front of a, a period of big metamorphosis and if we, if we for, for understanding that if we only 
uh, we are critic with what is uh, our past and present, you got part of the, 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 the tools, but the real tools is to, to open your mind and how could be uh, the elements that they can use for a new circumstance I'm gonna be, and we are moving from the anthropocentric mm -hmm. uh, point of view, a more biocentric. That, that is the, the main argument, and uh, we need a lot of uh, flexibility. Then if we can call it the feminine side, best uh, for everyone. <laughs> so you, uh, what you're suggesting is that there are sort of lots of examples of, um, I suppose, uh, feminist scholars who showed us that flexibility is very important in the future of design? I think you need flexibility to be adaptive in a in a circumstance which is very mutable. I know then it's very important, and you you need uh, to be very open. When we say um, adaptive, perhaps it's always limitative. You need a lot of different tools, you know, to but you have to understand uh, what means you are inside a situation which is uh, evolving that evolves in a in a more quick way or in in, in many many directions. There are many arguments, but if you read, and also I think Marguerite Jusener, she was fantastic. She was a big helper. She did a, a one fantastic book about the, with the idea of uh, uh, Pietra Filosofale and uh, the, the idea of uh, alchemism, which is part of understanding what means uh, transformation. But uh, there the can be Marina Abramo, which we gave her um, an hour now in Spain and part of a jury of art. And uh, we were so happy to, to understand how much she she moved, no? because she was searching for new rules, or new ways like, to adapt to, to new the circumstance we have. Then they are, I think, uh, no, sorry, they are a lot of, in my land, or in a land that is more nearby, for example, with, with uh, with Cassina um, to 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 do a, to discover with the foundation uh, uh, Vuitton the, the the work with uh, Charlotte Perriand to do an exhibition dedicated now the whole building to her work and to relate it to with the context that, that's been a, a very interesting much more interesting part that was seeming at the beginning. It was seeming interesting, but was dramatically interesting. Okay? We were really happy. And then Olina Bobardi, uh, any kind of, I remember in, in Brazil, getting into some of her architectures and understanding the way this woman got into transformation in a place where things were, were moving. And she was really in this metamorphosis, you know, of we can go on uh, with a lot of uh, examples of human beings in between them, fantastic women, like, obviously. Of course, but that is a that's a, a good segue actually to to Jean Toussaint. Pierre, you mentioned that you saw something quite similar in Jean Toussaint. You said when she joined Cartier into, in 1919 or 1920, I think around the same time the Bauhaus was founded in Germany and was one of the first design schools to admit women. Um, uh, Jean Toussaint joined um, Cartier, but you said in a previous conversation um, that we had that she really had to forge her own way and there was yes. absolutely no precedent. So she, she, she had to fight, <laughs> that, that's true. She was hired by Louis Cartier uh, because uh, of her natural uh, taste and elegance that Louis Cartier was seeing in her. Uh, and in fact, he gave her the responsibility of a department that didn't exist at Cartier. Uh, it, it reminds me what in your exhibition it is said about the Bauhaus, where women were first given uh, the task of uh, working on textile or, or a fabric. It was the same for Jeanne Toussaint. She was given the task of uh, bags, uh, accessories uh, for women uh, at first. But why was it so? Why Louis Cartier? Um, had that opinion and, and judgment on her uh, talent. Because let's not forget that uh, Jean Toussaint didn't uh, study uh, art or, or whatsoever. Uh, she was uh, in her uh, young 30s uh, when uh, Louis Cartier hired her. And she had a kind of strange career <laughs> before joining Cartier because she was an independent woman, let's put it that way. <laughs> she, she was living uh, with and from, let's say, uh, proeminent masculine characters. Uh, she had important lovers. Um, she could be called as a courtesan uh, in the first years of the 20th century. Her nickname, by the way, uh, among that world was the panther. 
and uh, that's <laughs> the nickname. So, and it, it, was, it was referring to her independence, meaning that um, she was uh, leading her own life the way she wanted. And mm -hmm. uh, that was the reputation she, she had. And um, she was not you know, pursuing her that kind of career at all costs. She, she was really uh, wanting to be to, with the right person and the, the right way and be considered as really uh, a, respectful, a respectful person. And she probably, um, because of her life, uh, was in touch and in contact with, uh, let's say, uh, the best of creativity in terms of uh, women garment, for instance. She, she, was, uh, she was also a model for haute couture. Uh, so she was in contact with creative people like Doucet, like, like Poiré, like all, all these guys. Uh, she was a very good friend from the beginning of the 20th century to uh, Coco Chanel. You know, we have a portrait uh, at Cartier of her by Paul Helleux, and she's wearing a hat that is a creation of Coco Chanel before she was a couturier. She became a couturier. And, uh, and uh, so she made, she conceived her own taste. And um, she knew uh, much later uh, Hubert de Givenchy, mm -hmm. the couturier. And uh, she had a, a, a close relationship with him because uh, you know, because of her past uh, of, uh, in, the, in, the, in the world of couture, uh, they exchange a lot about that. And he, uh, he told me that, you know, Jeanne Toussaint was not, uh, you know, à la mode. She was elegant, you know, and it, in his mouth, it was very interesting. So anyway, that notion of independence, uh, a different eye on, uh, you know, women garment, what was suitable for, for ladies and, and that notion of freedom was really uh, the values she was carrying. And I think that's the main reasons behind the choice of, uh, of Louis Cartier. And then she handled that specific um, uh, sector, that specific department of women accessories and, and bags for you know, the entire career. And she had no other men looking or no other person looking at her cho choices. She was totally independent. On, on that. And on top of that, Louis Cartier put her um, in um, part of, um, as a member of the creative committee of Cartier for all the rest of her production. Meaning she had already an eye on jewelry, watches, uh, um, you know, whatever, I think uh, objects, precious objects and whatever, for, for more than 10, from 13 years before, at one moment, Louis Cartier decided she will be my successor, you know, and that was very important. And why she had to fight, not on a special uh, specific department, but once she had to be the artistic director for all the rest of her production, then came the difficulties because uh, the jury world at the beginning of the thirties was essentially a men world. And, um, and also you had a sort of competition with the designers, all men, um, you know, the, the, the chiefs of the atelier, all men, the Cartier brothers in the rest of the, of the world, all men. And she had to, to impose herself and not being only supported by Louis Cartier. Louis Cartier was no longer there, you know, but be, she had to be um, to, to, um, um, to have an authority on them, proving that she was good at what she was doing. And it, take, it took a certain time uh, not to be uh, fighting uh, anymore. And I think she had to, work, to, to wait for the Second World War when she was almost left alone during the occupation days in Paris to create respect, you know, among the other people. So only at the beginning of the 40s, she had, uh, I think, um, the full power. Mm -hmm. So, And it explains a lot in terms of what she added to the creation because even her ideas... Uh, you know, she had to impose them, you know, and uh, for the designers. Okay, um, it's interesting that you say it's, it was entirely a men's world, even though what was being designed was mostly for women, right? And you still yeah. would suggest that after your research uh, that there wasn't any sort of sympathy towards her or the fact that she was credited with perhaps having more empathy for the clientele that she was designing for? Um, she, you know, it's, it's the jewelry world is a world where, especially at Cartier, you know, we, um, 
at Cartier, what uh, is uh, visible is the Cartier signature. And in fact, at Cartier, we do consider what the creation is a collective work. So not one person is put in the front to, uh, to explain the, the creation. So um, Louis Cartier was, was the boss, was the owner. So that's why, you know, he was in front of a clientele because there was a logic there. You know, he was bearing the same name as a company uh, and he was the boss for everything. But once Jeanne Toussaint was there, not belonging to the family, she was at the level of all the other people uh, contributing to the creative process, you know, and not uh, the one to be in front of a clientele. So it could happen only through special order because then through special order, she had to face uh, together with the salespeople, the, the, the client. So she started to be known by a, a minority of faithful clients uh, um, only, let's say, at the end of the, of, the, of the 30s. And in the media, for instance, uh, she was not present. She started to be present in the media just after the Second World War also, and in a very, very, um, let's say, shy scale, I would say, <laughs> you know. Uh, it's not the world of couture, you know, where the artistic director takes the front seat, you know, and um, mm -hmm. it's not exactly the, 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 the same thing. So now we talk about Jean Toussaint. And now we, because many years, you know, have, uh, have passed since uh, she left and we recognize her role. And internally, her role was recognized, but externally, it was not communicated. Mm -hmm. um, so she became a really important role model, I suppose, um, as a design entrepreneur, or she is recognized as one now, especially as a creative director. Patricia, can I ask you, you've also spoken about role models for you as a creative director. Um, you've also sort of identified some people who were really relevant to your work, right? Well, obviously, uh, I, I was thinking, I was lost in what you were, what you were telling now, and I was remembered the photo of this fantastic lady all in black, uh, uh, like if a film from Wes Anderson, and uh, with, the, with the boots, with the very yes. crafted boots. I don't know. They are looking first. You think they are cowboy boots? I don't know. They are very crafted. I know it's an Anatolian. Craft. Yes, they come. They come and from Russia. This yeah, is they, something like this. In fact, it was a gift yes. from Louis yeah. Cartier. He brought back yes. from uh, from Russia. Yes. And yes. They were they were red leather. Yes. 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 I love that photo. I associate this immediately with, for example, now that Lina Vermuller no, uh, went away, and uh, they were doing. TV or in, in, in my computer, I was seeing things about her, and then there was, and she, she created her rules in some way. Mm -hmm. Lena was another kind, she was really possibly um, um, a kind of personage being a, a filmmaker. Uh, she, she had a kind of different, uh, she, she, she is found in another space, but each per person has a, an incredible, uh, a different way to be. But I, I love it, she was my, my petite panthère. Okay? <laughs> For him, she was a petite panthère. When you say petite panthère, it means she's a big panthère, no? Yes. And he used the diminutive, it means uh, perhaps she's uh, uh, the, the way he was calling her, no? Uh, the family, la petite panthère, uh, and I think at the end, from Cartier, one of the, when you think about Cartier, you see, you see the panther and she mm -hmm. was the one Echo, yes. having the intuition of yes. um, uh, associating this animal to the yeah. company. And she gave the, the, the more symbolic element, Echo. Yeah. I but I think, I think- The only uh, one, but an important one, no? Without any judgment on her, let's say, previous career, let's call it that way, I think her head dependence she enjoyed, she enjoyed before joining Cartier, mm -hmm. was in a, a way of pathing the way for other women to enjoy mm -hmm also that kind of freedom in a different way, of course. But that's why probably, I think, she understood um, how women wanted to express themselves in a free way. It helped a lot, I think, to get an, to, to, to put an input in the, in the creations to say, you know, women, they want to, to wear something else that men traditionally uh, imagine, mm. you know? They, and mm. I think she helped a lot to imagine an, another kind of jury. And uh, she, you know, uh, Cecil Bitton uh, wrote an entire chapter on her uh, in a book when he describes all the creative people in Paris. And he said that nobody realizes exactly what she did in, in the world of jury because, you know, it's, a, it's an opaque world in a way. But the, the, he said that contemporary jury was linked to 
uh, to Jeanne Toussaint because people really realize in the future what she brought in, you know, uh, the, the fluidity, the articulation, the, the lightness, and also that free spirit. And I think she was free spirited much before many other creators in the world of jewelry. I think the path of, um, of our work, or our life of creativity that you, at the end, is something that you, you create a kind of mm, melted passage where, where you, uh, I think the uh, creativity arrives to you, things, the, the, the good moment, the, the, the good intuitions, the good things, they come, but they come because you have, you have a, a kind of crossovers that are part of the culture that you you get on your on your life and your life and there are two things that they are uh, parallel they, 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 you have to 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 feed your your curiosity your yes. your sensibility every day and yes. the part that if you begin before is better or possibly the disruptive uh, a disruptive way to to yes. to see the world is many times very important I could then I, when I see a young person and I see them in a moment which is a bit disruptive then we are all afraid you know because and they say, perhaps they say, this is a good moment I go then if she if he can or she can go through perhaps we are in the best moment yeah. of, of yeah. his or her it's life very important. um I would like to go back to something that Pierre just kind of commented on the way um that John Toussaint was kind of creating jewelry um that from her own experiences that perhaps responded to different freedoms that women were looking for at the time. And Estelle, you are currently looking at design and women from, from a kind of a, the opposite perspective that we were looking at it. We were looking very much at the, the women who created design, but you are looking at objects and jewelry through tra like tracing the developments of women's history through those objects. Can you tell us a little bit about that? Yes, um, late 19, early 20th century, so the evolution of women's condition, and that's a major issue, uh, they left from being submitted, we talk a lot about that, from uh, to their fathers and husbands authority to their um, the discovery of their own autonomy, and that was a great adventure, and um, it is true that um, it can be this women and can be um, reflected by the jewels that were made for them and their choice, um, because it is easy to forget that if the jewels were mainly made for women, uh, they were long designed, chosen, bought and owned uh, by men. Uh, so it's very interesting to see this um, evolution. And if we think about it, it was the same for fashion and fashion magazines, uh, even if they were intended for women, but they were in the hand of men for a very long time too. Um, just as Pierre just said, right? Um, like at yeah. the time that Jean Toussaint came in, it was very much a men's world, even though it was designed for women. Exactly. And um, so in the first decades of the 20th century, what we can see is that the evolution of jewels are following uh, the evolution of fashion, uh, of course, the disappearance of the corset, the hair cut shorter, uh, women starting to um, lead their own life by smoking and putting on makeup. Um, will motivate new ornaments, new materials, new shapes, material and accessories. And it is interesting to see that through those objects, you can see, you can read as well, um, a new freedom of the body. Uh, like you have uh, brooches replacing stomachers or ancient uh, corset brooches. Uh, you have bandeaux replacing tiaras, uh, the rise of sautoir, these very long necklaces, uh, the creation of vanity and cigarette cases and etc. So from the objects, then you can go back to uh, the women that were wearing the objects uh, after. And um, it's true that objects, uh, the jewels being an object, uh, an image of status in the society, um, you can see the evolution uh, to the objects becoming more the mirror of your personality, uh, showing off about yourself, your choices, and your dreams, of course. Um, 
would women start to want to um, assert themselves through the jewels they wear? They want more vivid colors, a whole new range of motif, like we talked about it, uh, the panther, of course, that was so powerful, but also tigers, crocodiles, dragons, uh, and uh, wonderful birds um, belong to this new uh, repertoire. And you can see that at Cartier too. Uh, there is also a new designs inspired by uh, other cultures uh, like Persia, Russia, Egypt, Japan and China um, that allow to change, you know, to shed skin, to travel away in your mind, if not for real, um, and to dream about being different and leading different lives, like kind of escaping the reality uh, through the jewels you could wear. So that's uh, also um, something that is uh, important, uh, especially uh, right now, which uh, is very interesting, is that um, you don't have gender anymore wearing jewels and you go more to a jewel that could be worn either by men or women and sometimes women like to choose like very manly designed um, watches uh, or the opposite men dare to wear more like colorful jewels or to wear jewels at all so yeah that's very interesting to read um, through the evolution of the society through the objects. Um, but you're also conducting this research in an Asian context, right? Because you're at the Palace Museum in Hong Kong. So um, that must be quite a different perspective too, correct? Yes, what happened in the West and what happened in China mainly um, is different, of course, but you can notice a certain um, Simultaneity, um, yeah, things are happening quite at the same time, even though differently. Um, women escaped the corset in the West while Chinese women escaped the binded fruits. I mean, it's like a very um, other um, difficult tradition too. Um, and you have the two world wars that will do a lot for the freedom of women too, uh, finding, helping them to find their place uh, in new place in the society, a new modern, um, women, uh, of course. But in terms of women working as designers in Asia, is there any, anything that you've kind of um, observed that may have been different to the way um, it worked in Europe? It's, it's very different. The point of view of um, craftsmanship is so different between the East and the West, especially because um, in China, you have very few people signing their work. And uh, so you don't have the names and you don't really remember who did this. But at the same um, time, you don't have like the separation between arts and crafts that we have in the West. So um, it is completely different. And it's difficult to know exactly um, how women were involved in the creation of objects or um, textile or whatever, um, as we have absolutely no idea. Yeah, it's something that we found in the research of our exhibition as well, is that um, the kind of signing of the work is actually absolutely imperative to being able to kind of trace back history and um, to understand who did what. Um, we also understand that sometimes design is very collaborative, as it was, for instance, at Cartier as well, where, yes, Jean Toussaint uh, made a made a large impact and also signed off on the drawings but it was internally in the company understood as a collaborative endeavor um, but but one thing that we also did realize is that many um, women in especially in the early 20th century kind of worked in areas of design that weren't so visible they were labeled as craft or as um, social design um, there were things like ceramics um, and textiles and uh, they were sort of um, distinctly labeled as as something that was suitable for women and we also found that many of them kind of chose these fields of endeavor because that that made sure that they could kind of create their own careers and were largely not hindered 
um, by others. Um, Patricia, do you feel like these connotations sometimes still exist today or has it completely gone? You are speaking a little bit about what at the end the area of craft that uh, in some way has been given to women. But I, 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 I'm not interested. The word craft or the craft, craftsman uh, is for me something very interesting without any kind of labor from, I mean, mm -hmm. from any sides. I go, because I think, um, I don't know, as craft, they always show us that the, they, they, all the archaic values that for me are so important, they can become um, even a kind of container of modernity. Then for mm -hmm. me, I'm always searching where I can get a, a connection in between um, something that I find and uh, a possibility of innovation. And the, the, the world of craftsmanship uh, sometimes uh, is uh, in, in, in its um, continuous um, come, come back to, to a circularity, to, to try to get a kind of perfection because it's very handmade or because it's done with a technique that is uh, translating uh, between people from a family or from a part of the uh, the country, or th that, that I absorb my, my my curiosity in, in a strong way. And then I like it a lot the idea of a craft uh, connected with social work, connected with uh, finding new roots from archaic, archaic values. I, th there is a, a lot of um, a lot of space to to research. I don't know if I'm answering to you uh, in relation with. I, I've been part of the jury of Loef Craft Prize, which is uh, four or five years. And I've been lucky or very honored to be part of this jury. Uh, now is, is the, uh, this is springtime is gonna be the next time. And I like a lot the way we observe these boundaries in between, you know, the world of design, the world of architecture, the way of other artists, uh, all the art. There is a kind of undefined space of craft which I, I like a lot because it's, it's connected with this kind of regeneration, circularity, a research of beauty, but done in a quite archaic, um, and then sometimes part of them, they find incredible new ways. Then it's an argument fascinating for, for me. I don't, know, I don't know if I can <laughs> yeah, answer. I think, I think what you're saying, I mean, it's, it's also something that I suppose we found um, in uh, in our research is that um, of course you know for a long time jury is the same jury is it has to do a lot with this uh, what I'm saying uh, yeah yeah exactly and it's um and it's kind of like uh, now that we are all uh, we we were not the only people researching women in design so uh, other curators like Estelle and other like feminist collectives and so on and what we are in, uncovering isn't just that we are finding um, interesting practitioners in design or people who've been overlooked, but also it makes us question these stereotypes and um, connotations That's again. Great. I think what you're saying is that, you know, we if we sort of meld them all together, um, we find a more interesting history and also perhaps future of design, right? I, I, I mean, I'm thinking about speaking, listening to you. I think about, for example, Judy Chicago, this artist from uh, mm -hmm. America uh, that I remember seeing in uh, uh, Brooklyn, out of New York. This, the, the, I don't know, the last uh, dinner, the last party, I don't remember well the name. And uh, uh, the, the dinner party, I think. And this was this big table, a triangle done in the 70s with a collective of women in a very crafted way, because each mm. one were doing, you know, the idea of a ceramic uh, uh, embroidery, uh, but with a very open, dedicated to all the women that in the past didn't have a voice because they were not invited to a real uh, dinner. They were, didn't have a voice in a dinner. Then all these things, I always dream one day that we can do with her, I call, uh, with new energy. Perhaps it's not me, it's others that are gonna do. A new, uh, a renovated, I call, triangle of, uh, dedicated to all minorities in a large way, not only women. No, and then I, no, so that is something that is, an artist coming from past, but thinking uh, through craft, but working uh, through messages and, and context. Uh, very interesting. Uh, 
Bravo, yeah, Chicago. So that, uh, that really Chicago dinner, we didn't uh, have it in our exhibition, but it's certainly yeah. incredibly interesting. Very fantastic. Yeah. And yes, you're right. I mean, it does, like this conversation that we're having about the past really does open up uh, a lot of uh, kind of possibilities for the future. So I think uh, our hour is almost up. I would actually like to... Um, Sort of perhaps give the last word to Pierre. We've spoken to uh, spoken about Cartier quite a lot, and maybe um, and you've researched Jean Chosin for such a long time. What do you think is maybe one of the works or one of the legacies she's kind of leaving for the world of design that we should be remembering her by, or that might also sort of um, help us think about the future of design? She, uh, well, when we think of it. Uh, apart from, uh, let's say, um, specific uh, aesthetical uh, creation, but you can see in, in a like creation, the like, you know, yeah. like the panther, for instance, or I don't know, or, uh, the fluidity of, um, you know, some motif that are both uh, figurative or can be seen like figurative or abstract, like, you know, the grapes of beads, you know, that can be carved, uh, that can move, that can be, uh, you know, on bracelets or like cascades, you know, of... Um, of jury and you know it was said that um, in terms of jury not only Jean Toussaint pushed to create jury that could accompany the new movements of, of women because also the, the, the new freedom that women did enjoy was linked with a new kind of movement that were authorized to, to, to do let's not forget for instance that with the corset they could yeah, like they were not said. able to take their child on the ground and to to carry it to carry them you know in their in their arms you know the corset was preventing them from doing so so imagine the relationship between kids and women because of a corset so it many many other movements came and uh, and jury was created to accompany uh, uh, those new movements but it was said that with her jury Jean Toussaint invented new women movements you know and thanks to the jury the women were moving in another way also just because you know uh, there was an effect created with a movement with her jury even some noise you know with a uh, uh with the beads you know uh hurting each other you know and things like that so she was inventing a new way of wearing jewelry but i think the the most important the most important part of her work not only for cartier but i think for the entire world of jewelry is that um she broke the mold you know of social taboos uh, in uh, the way women were allowed to express themselves, you know, and, and that mold was was really social, and um, and that mold was linked to the relationship with family and men, you know. There was a type of jury for every age of a woman before be, till the First World War, till the twenties, you know. You couldn't wear the same jury when you were not married. Uh, when you were married but not having kids, uh, then of course all the different type of jury during the day, different circumstances. And when you were, uh, let's say, um, a grandmother, <laughs> let's say, or your 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 kids were married, you you didn't behave the same way. You had to adopt a position of a like a retired woman. So you know everything was codified. You know it's, it was not forbidden, but it was a pressure. You know, and Jean Toussaint broke all that, you mm -hmm. know, and uh, and um, of course, a clientele at the beginning was a very uh, niche clientele, you know, very wealthy ladies, you know, uh, that could enjoy already a freedom before many others because uh, they had their own wealth, you know, like uh, like Desi Fellows, like uh, Baba Hutton, you know, uh, and they didn't need men, you know, to 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 have their money and to spend their money. So that was the most appropriate clientele for that new kind of jury created mm. by, by Jeanne. But what was very important, and uh, I think uh, I joined Estelle on, the, on that idea of uh, role models, <laughs> uh, I think those ladies appeared like models, you know, and they, they were very important because they were in magazines, uh, they were represented, and they gave the idea to many other women, you know, to, to, to do something with their own life the way they wanted to do it. So um, I think that's probably for me the most important legacy uh, for Jeanne Toussaint, you know. Fantastic, those are great words. Thank you so much. It was really interesting to hear about 
especially that last piece and to kind of not just think about the objects that women designed, but also um, how they kind of signify um, new freedoms for women in history. So we should be really looking forward to Estelle's exhibition then, which, which we'll talk about that, I think. So, thank you. <laughs> yeah. Um, well, yeah. Uh, thank you very much for your time and, um, and your contribution. And I'm really looking forward to speaking with you again. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye.